but uh, just first I will go over the format of tonight's debate and also the rules that structure it. So my job here is twofold. My first is to ensure a consistent quality of debate. My second is to ensure the format of the, uh, the uh, safe space policy is upheld. So the format for those of you who are not aware. Both speakers will be given five minutes of protected speech to begin with. They'll be followed by ten minutes where they will discuss with each other, which I'll we'll try and shift here. Shuffle backwards a little bit. Um, this will be followed by 20 minutes of questions from the floor. Uh, questions will be chosen at random. Both speakers will have a chance to respond to these questions. They'll be followed by another 10 minutes of debate and then closing five minutes of protected speech each. Uh, it was agreed beforehand that you would lead the first one, is that correct? And then Milo will go second. This will apply in both instances of protected speech. This has been agreed on by all participants. Now, with regards to the safe space policy, as a, university of, as a Bristol Student Union based society, uh, the safe space policy is active in the events run by UBJS. This encompasses the following and applies to all participants, myself and every member of the audience. To begin with, there will be no heckling at any point, uh, there will be no unnecessary slurs, <laughs> there will be no mention of individuals or groups currently residing within this university as it could make them targets for harassment. Um, but by and large, I trust everybody as responsible adults to uphold these standards, and I think, by and large, we can have a very productive debate. So, oh yeah, also, if you are not happy with the way this event is run, I do take that very seriously, the Student Union does have a feedback process. Um, you can get in touch with them afterwards if need be. So, I think that covers everything. Yeah? Right then. Without further ado, Rebecca, you have the first... Am I staying here? Or am I um, for now, you are allowed to move around. But if I want to stay, I can. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, right. Assuming this is five minutes, not five seconds. Yeah. Okay. Are we all ready? All right. Let's go. Um, I struggle. Turns out that was five seconds. <laughs> 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 okay, now I'm going to count manually. <laughs> you may begin. My apologies. Um, yeah, so basically, I struggle to understand why anyone would think that we've reached an age of gender equality. Because uh, it seems kind of obvious to me that we're all getting shafted by crappy gender politics. Um, but the more I thought about it, I sort of started to think that maybe the way people think about gender politics is similar to the way that people think about God. And if you don't experience it, then it's really hard to believe or see that it exists. Um, that's not a judgment on whether God does or doesn't, it's just an article. Um, what's more, I think it's really hard to care about things that you don't perceive as existing um, and things that don't affect you. And I think our emotional outpouring at the Paris attack really illustrates that that we're kind of much more indifferent to things that don't happen to people who we feel are like us. Um, and so we feel we care about things that are sort of immediate and relevant to our lives because I think human beings are fundamentally selfish, all of us. Um, I think one of feminism's biggest mistakes is that we have been asking people to care about issues that don't affect them or that they don't perceive to affect them. And if you don't feel the same <coughs> thing at night or you haven't been critiqued about your work on the basis of how pretty you are or if you don't even feel ruining your career by getting pregnant, then I can see how it would be really hard to um, <laughs> It's a fantastic opening. Um, most of the problems that you'll hear about, the wage gap and uh, rape culture, these things aren't real, and we'll explain why uh, over the course of this debate. Um, but most of them stem from a uh, mistake that the progressive left has made in um, the idea of patriarchy. Now, um, <laughs> It's weird, it, it can be difficult to work, wrap your head around how it can be that men running everything is bad for men. And of course it is just as preposterous as it sounds. Um, what the majority of these things come from is this sort of wacky idea on the left that a lot of um, gender is performance, that it's socially constructed, that um, there's nothing innate about being a man and nothing innate about being a woman. And the, you know, the, the sorts of arguments that you sometimes hear from feminists about the patriarchy hurting men uh, is based on this idea. It's based, to, based on the idea that you know, being a man is a performance and we can teach men out of the bad things that they do. Uh, this is no basis in biology, no basis in science, no basis in fact. Um, 
to get back to the, the question, you know, are we living in an age of equality? Well, we've sort of gone past that, actually. We've gone past the age of equality. The pendulum has swung the other way. Men are now routinely ridiculed, diminished, demeaned, and criticized in the public square for being men. And I don't mean for their performance as men. I mean for the biological, essential nature that they have as men. The idea of the, you know, the, the patriarchy is a preposterous feminist myth. Uh, it was cooked up on university campuses by gender activists who used a variety of um, bullshit statistics to try to bolster, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> activist statistics, uh, to try to bolster the position that women were somehow an oppressed class. Uh, that simply isn't true. White women in the West are the most privileged class of people who have ever lived. Uh, and what's interesting about people who uh, attain power and um, uh, influence and hegemony over culture is how they behave when they get there. <coughs> now, the way, once, one of the ways you know that women are you know, one of the most privileged classes ever is how their every grievance is pandered to by the mainstream media and by universities and by just about everybody else, by politicians too. And not just real grievances. And not even just the manufactured ones like rape culture and the pay gap, which isn't real, but their feelings too. Um, men's feelings are routinely ridiculed by precisely the kind of feminism that Rebecca Reed practices in her column every day. She criticizes ads that are uh, too, uh, too saucy and too sexist. She wrote that she was fine with objectifying uh, a man, um, but she doesn't agree with objectifying women. Now, these, it, 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 it's perfectly reasonable for her to come here and to try to wrong foot me by talking about men's rights. But reading her work uh, tells a quite a different story. And what I want to talk with you about today, what I want to encourage you to, to realize, is that the pendulum has swung very dangerously in, in an opposite direction. And feminists who are in their 30s and 40s writing for national newspapers don't understand what young men go through. They don't understand the situation in school, where in America one in seven young boys is placed on uh, Adderall or Ritalin because he's held up to a feminine standard of behavior. They don't understand the struggles men are going through in education. Uh, tests have been gerrymandered to fit the way that women learn better. Women prefer coursework, they don't test well on exams. So we've changed that. And now more women go to college, more women are graduating, women get higher grades. When a man grows up further into the workplace, uh, there's a 2015 Cornell study that showed um, women have a two to one advantage going for the same job with the same qualifications just for being women. Now, to try to take this out into an abstract discussion about how the patriarchy hurts men is to ignore the reality that young men are really suffering. And young men are suffering at precisely the kind of sociopathic, ugly third wave feminism which is running rampant on campuses. It is responsible. Um, is it uh, a violation of space, safe space policy to criticize the safe space policy? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, if you promise not to, no, it's it not is. a violation if you promise not to swear at it. <laughs> <laughs> Or attack the people who made this policy. I'd like to point out actually this policy will point to start on. So, two, what? One key underlying theory of that is gender constructed. Does that seem like a fair place to start? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, Mala, you have the last word, so you begin, but you do have the right to interrupt each other, although please do let each other finish each other's sentences. Is gender constructed? Um, it's really difficult, as somebody who is very gender-typical, which I am, to say that it isn't, because my experience is that gender tends to be as it's presented. But other people who have a better experience of being not typically gendered seem to, see, seem to feel that it is a construction, so I'm more likely to listen to that. And I think people, my perception of it is that gender is more of a spectrum, and you get people at different ends of spectrum that have different sort of characteristics of different parts, so it's unlike, I think it's sort of more of a broad church than just black and white. Okay, would you catch one? That's not what whether gender is constructed or not means, you were talking about sexual orientation. Um, no. What, yeah, there is a biological... So point, sorry, what were you talking about? I, meant, I, meant, I meant gender, I think you gender is a spectrum, sorry. So okay. Yeah, I think gender is a spectrum. Right, uh, gender is not socially, uh, not socially constructed, that is a uh, kooky, progressive myth. Uh, um, gender has a... Bi <laughs> no, that's fine. What about you now? Just come to my I can't say kooky. Like, <laughs> you have every right to say kooky. Come <laughs> 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 no, you, you may say kooky as much as you like. I would just prefer that there were a point. Please continue. You say kooky, my You said as much as you like. Gender uh, has a biological basis. 
men are born men because of chromosomal, chromosomal uh, factors, and they have uh, hormones that mean that they develop in a particular way. Now, there are people who have strange medical conditions that uh, buck that trend. But gender it has a basis in biology, and the, um, most of what you will hear from feminists these days denies that basis in biology. And it, requ it needs to do that, because it needs to tell you that uh, men can somehow be fixed. It wants to tell you that the way that men behave is somehow broken, somehow faulty, that uh, max masculinity is toxic. That's the sort of tradition from which a lot of Rebecca's writing flows, uh, flows from. And it, what, it, what it's seeking to demonstrate to you, what it's trying to persuade you of, is that there is something wrong with being a man. And we see this when uh, young boys are held up to feminine, uh, feminine behaviour standards. We see it when uh, you know, um, behaviour in the public square is, uh, you know, is determined by uh, what it's acceptable for, how it's acceptable for a woman to behave. There is a very clear brain difference between men and women. Men and women think differently. They have different aptitudes. When a feminist tries to convince you, for example, that the reason there aren't more women in STEM subjects is that some sort of mystical patriarchal energy, sorry for mystical, um, what they're trying to do is tell you that gender is a performance and a construct and that there can be no biological basis for the differences between men and women. That's that insane. That. I, don't, I think, particularly on the STEM side, I do think it's fair to say that women, girls, are less encouraged into those subjects from an early age. Whether there is also a predisposition towards it or not, I don't know. I am not well versed enough in the science of brain neurology to know. But what I do know is that I went to an all-girls school where sciences were this bizarre thing that nobody did, and my female contemporaries weren't ever pushed towards STEM subjects. So there is at least both of those are true. If not, I don't, I don't know about the brain thing. There's no evidence that women are being systematically discouraged or blocked from any of these courses. More women go to university these days. More women are going to be doctors. For science. Biology, veterinary medicine, uh, yes, both of those things. But what about other ones? Well, this is the question. If you want to claim that there is some kind of, uh, some sort of uh, patriarchal force or some sort of sexism preventing women into going into physics and maths, you have to explain why, explain why there isn't one in medicine, veterinary, veterinary science, or biology, where women dominate. Would you go to it? What I would like to say is that I think the same problem exists in the arts. I don't think that boys are encouraged to explore writing and drama and dance and poetry. I think it's a problem that runs on both sides. But nobody complains about that. I'm complaining about it right now.